Welcome to Ear Biscuits, I'm Link. And I'm Rhett. This week at the round table of dim lighting, we are exploring the question, what are our top 10 most influential TV shows? Yeah, so over the course of our lives, we've watched our fair share of television. And, and it's interesting, as I started thinking about this, at certain pockets of my life, I was watching a lot more television. And, um, and other times less. And so I think that my list, which I have not shared with you and you have not shared your top 10 list with me. That's what we're about to do. Oh, we're gonna do that and share it with you, listener. Um, it, it, it was really a, a truck, a trucking back down memory lane, hmm. you know? And it, uh, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised by the things that came up when I started thinking about um, the television shows that not only influenced me in terms of like my creative brain, but also in terms of my life, just um, just personal impact. Mm-hmm. So this is not necessarily our favorite television shows, but it kind of kind of is. Like I have a lot of honorable mentions. Well, like, I would say most significant. Most sig- I would be most significant in our lives, but yeah. that's not as clear and easy to say as right. influential. But this is not what we believe to be our top ten best, best. television mm-hmm. shows of all time. No, not even close. These are ones that we have personal connections to in one form or another which we can flesh out as we go through these things. Yeah, and I think, so while we did not share the list with one another, the one thing that we did do, just so you kind of understand the the exercise, is that we did tell each other that we would be going back uh, through our lives. So it it was kind of going back to like the the first television shows you could remember being significant and then I kind of just, I went through my entire life. Okay. And I didn't that, do it that way, but that that's what I'm saying is is that just to give you an idea of where they come from. You know, some are gonna be yeah. when we were a kid, some are more more recent. Not too many. Not all too all of mine are current. No, <laughs> just kidding. Uh but the reason why uh I thought to have this conversation was because something happened over the break that I chose not to share with you a couple of weeks back when I was giving my update on the holiday break and my family time mm-hmm. and when I went to Sedona. But um, so the thing I didn't tell you, something very special happened that our family bonded over something and it was the reality competition show known as Survivor. <laughs> Have you heard of this show? This is, this is a little weird. <laughs> it is a little weird, isn't it? Um, <laughs> But it turns out Survivor became a very special part of my family's holiday break and, and, a, and a very un, unanticipated bonding experience. You know, whatever it takes, man. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What, what, whatever it takes to get everybody it, together. Exactly, it, it, a magical thing happened. But a little backstory, when we were on tour in Australia, we went back to our rooms. Remember, we were in Sydney, we were like in that high rise apartment. Yeah. And High living. towards the end of that, the Sydney part of the trip, there was this one night where we're like, let's just order in. You kind of get to a point in your trip where you're like, I just don't think we can mobilize everybody to go out to eat again and I feel a little over it. So we just stayed in the room and ordered pizza. And I put on the television, I was like, hey, let's watch some Australian television. Mm. Cause you had been talking about how nice everybody was and you were learning a lot about the culture. I was, very, very nice. I was like, well, the Neils need to do that too. So we turn it on and it was um, the Australian version of Survivor just happened to be on. And I'm like, kids, this is, look at this, it's Survivor. And they're like, what? And I was like, well, it's a, it's a, it's basically a game show. Well not, it's a, it's a reality competition show. Basically, I, I was having trouble, it's like, you know, American Idol and like The Voice or reality competition shows where people sing, but it turns out that there's these other ones where they take a group of people and they just strand them out on an island or something. They had never heard of they this They had concept. never heard of Survivor I would in have thought form. that like Survivor was like in memes or something in some way. Like I, there's some way kids find out about it. I things. just don't think it's cool enough for that. <laughs> uh, I couldn't have told you that Survivor was still going on, but lo and behold, here it was, and this was the Australian version of Survivor, but it happened to be uh, an episode where they were bringing in, I think, heroes and villains from previous survivors. Oh, they're already there in Australia as well. Well, one of the guys was from America. 
a famous guy who I won't mention because I can't remember his name, but he's from another. Are Americans as cool to Australians as our Australians are to America? Could you sense that in the way that they like set him up? It was one of the first episodes of the season and they voted the guy off, so oh, I'll put it to you that Okay, way. apparently not. So apparently you have a correct understanding of Americans. But I was like, I was like, oh, you don't know about Survivor, so we just started watching it and we just watched the one episode out of context and everybody, I just kind of made a mental note. Everybody seemed to be into it. Yeah, They're asking questions about how Survivor worked as a game and stuff like that, so I just made a mental note, got back to the States. I and Je Jeff Probst was not involved uh, no. directly. No, he was not hosting. Right. He's not directly involved. I, I get back here, we're like, we're filming a couple of weeks ago and I think Kevin brought up something about Survivor and I was like, hold on, were you just talking about Survivor? And he was like, yeah, John and I are like big Survivor fans. If you see the two of us, or maybe somebody else chimed in, if you see the two of them together, I can guarantee you they're talking about Survivor. And I was like, I would have laughed at you just Two weeks ago. <laughs> well, before my Australian trip, but the funny thing that happened, and I told him the story, and they were like, I was like, I think my, I think we should start watching Survivor. Like, I think my family would be into it. He was like, oh, well you need, you definitely should, it's amazing, and th you know, they're like giddy and both into it, and I'm like, you guys are dorks, but okay, whatever. Yeah, definitely. And um, they said you should watch the Millennials versus Gen X season, which was like, three seasons ago, so pretty recent. It's still going. Said it's really good. There's like, there's like 400 seasons of this thing. No, literally I think there's like 36 seasons. It is still going. Yeah. I didn't even know it. Twice a year for almost 20 years, I guess. So the week leading up to our our trip, like the kids are getting out of school, we're like, you know, school work's dying down. Like I start putting on the Survivor and everybody gets into it. like every single member of the family. Unlike, I mean, it's so hard to pick out a movie or a television show that everybody can get into. But Lando loved it because it was like adventurous and outdoors and oh, that one's in Fiji where we went. Right. You know, so I was like, we've been to Fiji. We've experienced kinda, well we were like at a resort, yeah. they're not at a resort. We, not exactly the same thing. Like Lincoln, it, he loves strategy games, like he loves strategy, so he's into that. Lily really enjoyed the humor of kind of laughing at these people basically becoming characters, and Christy really enjoyed all of it. I don't know exactly what Christy loved, but um, I likes, think- She likes the guys with the shirts off. Guys with the shirts off. There was a model, a yeah, male model. Of course she does. And um, Survivor body, they call and it. And I liked the production, like the thing that, <laughs> I would pause Survivor and I would say, "Do you guys, do you see how brilliant the production is? Rhett, Rhett they have it down, I know this sounds ludicrous, but they no, have no, it, no, no, they have it no. down to a science. What's ludicrous is pausing and explaining it to your family. Appreciating it, no, I, I'm totally on the same page. I, I was, I was a, just overflowing with it's, joy. It's a production wonder, but we've talked about this. In fact, we right. talked about this very specific it's thing. It's that dad you, thing. You can't be the, I do the same thing. You cannot be the dad who makes your family stop and acknowledge how awesome something is because you think it's awesome. You have to just give it to them and let them experience it on their own terms. And and they so each No had, more pausing. They each had their thing, but I was trying to get them to appreciate what I appreciate, which was after all of these seasons, they've got, I mean, the people, the contestants, some of them are, they're obsessed with the game player survivor so they're really good at it and they invent new ways to play it and like new strategies come out. But the way that they present it in terms of the, the editing and they bring story out and you have these, these like character arcs is masterful. I mean, it really is amazing to me. And so it's, uh, I might have to alter my list and put Survivor on there. Like it is an oh, honorable. You're saying, so hold on, you're saying Survivor is not on, after all this, Survivor is not on your list? <laughs> it should be now because, I mean, it just seems so fresh. I don't know if it's gonna stand the test of time because when we, every night at Sedona, we would like do hiking and everything I talked about, but then we would also be talking about Survivor. Like we had something that everybody could talk about together during the day and then at night we'd be like, hey, let's all get on our PJs and let's make some popcorn and let's sit down and have our survivor session. Like everybody was into it. And like while we were hiking, Christian and I were like, wow, this is, this is, this is a rare gem of a moment. Thank you, Jeff Probst. And so are you 
like how much do you watch in a sitting? Uh, we would watch two or three episodes. Wow. In a sitting. And so we finished it the night before we were leaving Sedona and they were like, let's watch another one. So like we're out, we're out to dinner and like I'm Googling what's the, what are the best seasons of Survivor? There's like this like very involved Reddit thread, a Survivor Reddit thread where people talk about which, what are the best seasons and which ones to watch. And this one's the best, but you have to watch this one before because it spoils something about the strategy. So, and so I figured, I figured all that out and we're like, or right, we're gonna watch China. And so we come back and we start watching it and I'm like. What are you watching it on, what platform? Uh, a laptop. No, what platform? Uh, like a coffee table? No, I'm messing with you. Uh, Hulu. <laughs> Hulu has Survivor, all of them. Okay. And I immediately notice, uh, people are gushing about how great the season is. I'd never watched it. Um, the only season I had watched was Christy and I, like in our second year of marriage, we watched season three, Survivor Outback Australia, and there was a goat farmer. He was very funny. I, and That's I, the only season well, we watched. And, and I think that it was, it was a phenomenon yeah. at that time. Like Jesse and I watched multiple seasons. It was appointment television. Yeah, season for two. Us. Season two was like the number one show on television. I remember when it came out. Just but thinking, I didn't watch that. Just one. thinking it was like, this is so. This is changing every. This is changing everything. Yeah. And we had we had to watch it. And then I don't I don't remember what reality happened. reality competition shows really became mainstream. Just fell off. Then on the back end of that, Christian and I are watching things like The Mole, hosted by Anderson Cooper. Yep. That mm -hmm. was weird, like amazing race. But anyway, we started watching um, the China one, everybody's excited. It was the night after watching you know, the finale and having this big moment, this sense of closure. First thing I noticed, ooh, it's in 4.3, not widescreen. Oh, this this episode that Reddit going, going said was back. one of the best ones was 4.3. And it, this is much earlier, so. The things that they no longer do on Survivor, they did in that season, which was like, I can't even, it. it hold, 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 did you, did you go finish it? Uh, well, I'll skip to the chase and say that, like, we didn't even finish that episode. <gasps> because I don't think you can call yourself a real Survivor freak, or what do they call themselves? I didn't do that. Well, I didn't you, call you, myself you went that. to the Reddit thread. Did you subscribe to the Reddit thread? No, um, okay. but I had my hopes up, but I realized, you know, it, it they were explaining more that we already knew, like why are these people, these people, you know, like Jeff was doing these voiceovers, like everyone came in their own clothes, not knowing that we're about to take away their luggage. They don't even do that crap anymore. They're like, let's get to the game. People are coming in, they're like, the Gen Xers are coming in on this boat and the millennials are coming, mm. and they're like cutting to, interview footage about how the cultures are different and it's masterful. Oh, but they've gotten yeah. over all the crap of like, what you know, you just expect the business guy is gonna be in a business suit and you're not gonna ask any questions. It's part of the game. It literally has become much more of a game show than something that they had to like motivate in reality all the things that were happening, if that makes sense. Yeah, it I moved, the, the setup took longer. And you get attached to these characters and then they're gone and you gotta start from scratch all over. So what season are you drawing the line at? What, what, what's we acceptable? Just ha we haven't come back to it because I just feel like we'll never recapture the magic of, um, you know, the. You the, let you let 4-3 ruin your whole family's bonding well, experience? I added the other thing. It was just, I think the cadence of Survivor, you gotta go away from it for a little bit. Oh. So we're like, let's you, just. You can handle it twice. I've heard a year. lots of good things about The Good Place, Christy says. Let's watch The Good Place. <sighs> okay, a little different, different vibe. So now we as a family are hooked on The Good Place. So I actually think that television, we've, we're now discovering our kids are of an age that they're, they're enjoying things that I actually enjoy. And I'll get to one on my list which will lead to more conversation about this but I mean yeah, Lando's younger but because I mean Lily's almost 16, Lincoln's almost 14, they're developing a sense of humor that is we can watch the same stuff and enjoy it. It's no like two years ago we were, we would watch The Flash when it came out because they were really into that, yeah. you know. And it's, it's difficult to. And yeah, Lily's into Teen Wolf and to stick around for was that. Doctor Who now it's like Teen Wolf and some other shows like that that I d really don't care for. 
I can take a season of but I, I can take a season of the Flash. You know the, what I'm saying? And oh, that, I I enjoyed the yeah. Flash. I enjoyed watching it with them, but I didn't enjoy it for myself that right. much. Yeah, 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 yeah. But now we're getting into comedies that we can we can watch, like The Good Place. We're all watching it. and We're having a blast. My wife and children watched that with started that without me. So now I just kind of get in where I fit in. It's That's not, not quite the same. You got yeah. You got to start at the beginning. You gotta watch it straight well, through. Yeah, what am I gonna do now? You though? can't. It's gonna be a guy in the it's, attic. It's watching, really watching TV. By you can't watch. You can't watch the Good Place piecemeal. You gotta watch it as a, a linear chronological experience. Yeah. But I'm, you know, I'm reacquainting myself with television, in a way like I haven't watched sitcoms for years. Again, well, I'll get into some of this in my list, but I'm just, I'm figuring out that like the television and this may sound sad, is actually, it's a great tool to bring us together as a family and I, and I, and I was missing it. Hmm. But because of Survivor, and I think we will go back to Survivor, but it's, it's gonna, you know, let's go through a few now, more shows but, but, so and the, then we it, can come back it to it. It happened over the holidays, I mean, and we'll move on in a second, but when are you finding the, this time? Is this, are you, how are you, are you scheduling it? What, 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 are it weekends, what, what, when is this happening? Like what? After, how are you getting everybody together to watch like, television at the same time? Before, I mean, after dinner, before bedtime, you know, it's like before, so like that eight to nine o'clock. Is this happening once a week? Is this happening? I haven't scheduled it. Like, I mean, they How don't often does it happen? They don't have a lot of homework yet. Cause yeah, it, that's the thing is that. It's just gearing up, but it's pr it'll probably fizzle. And it might just be a weekend thing where it's like, hey, instead of watching a movie, let's binge watch four episodes of whatever show that we can all agree on. Because a movie, a movie is, is one and done, it's it's basically impossible for us all to agree on a movie. Hmm. That's probably not true, but I don't have a good list of we, like we've had, we've, we've, comedies. We've, we've had some good movie experiences, but I. I but the I television get it. experience, the way that <clears throat> it it continues to grow, there's there's episodes, so you can like have conversations and talk about it at dinner, and then come back to it, as opposed to a movie. Talking about Survivor at dinner. I, Invite me over next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are gonna talk about these top 10 uh, most influential television shows, but first I'm gonna talk about the top four most influential uh, wristbands that I'm wearing. Now, like you, you've been seeing me, you, you've been looking at my wrist, I know, those of you watching, and uh, you're like. Well, you're oh, only talking to people watching. What, what, is, what is, well, some people turn the video on and just listen. I heard about that. Is that right, you yeah. heard about that? Yeah. Heard about it, didn't see it. I'm not making a fashion statement unless you think I should be. Uh, I just wanted to show you the four available colors of the mythical wristband. It's a, it is a polymer of some kind. It smells like rubber. And- uh, Get you some. They'll fit around- Where would they get it? Most every wrist, mythical dot store. One size fits all. One size fits most. There's other stuff too. There's pins, there's I pop doubt it, sockets. I doubt it would fit like Andre the Giant. Can you imagine how big his wrist was? Right now? Well, it'd probably fit it now because yeah. it's probably just a shriveled bone. That's Why did I say that? I mean, that's. I don't think the bones shrivel. Yeah. Mythical.store. Okay. So uh, let's get into these lists. Um, yeah, so what are we, do you have any honorable mentions? Do you wanna start with number 10? We're gonna go back and forth. Uh, I, yes. did, I, I had honorable mentions, uh, but I have a feeling that some of some of the ones that made our list might be in each other's honorable mentions, and let's just, if that happens, it happens, but yeah, I don't wanna yeah, mention that's them. That's a good point. Let's make them honorable, let's not mention them. All right, give me, let's start with your number 10, brother. Number 10, the A-Team. Oh, crap. One of the reasons that I was thinking about the A-Team is the way that my phone works. So uh -huh, when yeah. I plug my phone into my car, it automatically starts playing the first song Often, I don't know how when it decides to do this. Often begins playing the first song in my entire library, which by alphabetical order is the A Team. And so, I and I think I've talked about this on the show before because you've gotten into my car and, and we're, we're like having a serious conversation coming back from a meeting, and all of a sudden, in 1972, a crack commando unit was sent to you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the, they're the, now known as Soldiers of Fortune. If you can find them. And you know, you, whatever, I can't remember it. I've heard it so many times and I haven't memorized it. But uh, I was actually in the car with Shepard the other day and he and, and started playing. He was like, what is that, Dad? He was very interested. Oh, yeah. So it's I began epic. to tell him about the A-Team, which 
uh, again, you know, this was a team of former military guys put together. They had a van driven by Mr. T who played B.A. Baracus and um, they would just get into stuff. Nobody ever actually got hurt because it was a network television show, but the reason that it was so influ- there, were, there were guns involved, but no one got shot. The reason that it made my list uh, is because not as much as another one that's higher up on my list. Oh yeah. But it is a show that defined the way that I interacted with television as a child, meaning there was a specific, now you probably remember specific nights and times because that's how your brain works. I don't remember, but I do remember that there was a specific night and a specific time where we had to be at the television between the years of 1983 to 1987 to watch the A team and my brother and I most of the time would watch it together in that span of our lives. I remember watching A team more as reruns, and I I actually don't think I was hooked on it in real time. I don't know what happened, but I I did love it. Like when I watched it, but I remember watching it during the day, so it must have been later. Uh, you know, it's also I found it to be this perfect at the time. I'm sure it doesn't hold up well, but at the time. It was this perfect mix of um, comedy and action and also just like you actually cared about what was happening because just the way that these guys interacted with each other, it was like there was a lot of laugh out loud moments and it's like the way Hannibal had his cigar and said, I love it when a plan comes, comes together. together. You know, that And was whenever just... they'd have to fly somewhere, they'd have to knock <laughs> Mr. T out because he was afraid of flying. Yeah. They'd have to knock him out. Yeah, And uh, Murdoch, you know, he was mentally ill. I mean, I don't think you could do that today. I don't know. I, I didn't watch the movie. Did you watch the movie? No. Um, I, I don't ruin things. Bradley like Cooper that. played Face. That makes sense in that movie. And I, I mean, I'm, I might watch anything Bradley Cooper's in now. So hmm. I might go back and watch the 18 movie. Yeah. So that that's my that's my number ten. My number ten is Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Hmm, so okay. I. I I didn't go chronological for all of this, but um, it just ended up at number 10. This man who was so schedule oriented, you know, and he, routine, his routine was impeccable. He always changed his shoes and he always changed his sweater and he always spoke directly to me. You know, I think that's something that I I just I think that's the key to Good Mythical Morning is how we speak directly to one viewer, and I I'm gonna credit Mr. Rogers for that because I watched Sesame Street religiously, and then Mr. Rogers Neighborhood would come on after it at my babysitter's house when I was like four or five, as early as I can remember. Right. But that was a that was a meaningful connection. Like I had a relationship. With Mister Rogers, what? In I watched the the documentary. What year did he did did that stop? Did did, did you? It kept. I mean, it kept going for a long time. But I I did. Even I did after outgrow you it. outgrew it. I did outgrow it. Yeah, I, I I was a, I was a fan like most kids, but it it didn't pop into my head when I thought about most influential. Um, I could. I felt like I couldn't miss it. I felt like he would know if I didn't watch the show. Like I, I felt as if I had a relationship with the guy. I, I don't. I think there was something about um, feeling like I was being taught. Mm -hmm. The parts I liked and remembered about Mister Rogers' Neighborhood was when he would go into what was the name of the land, um, whatever I land, can't remember. and uh, the puppets. Even though he, land? even though he was in those moments still teaching me, yeah. I don't know. Maybe I just it's my issue with authority. Like when it was just a man sitting there just saying things and trying to teach me lessons, I'd be like, "Boring old man sweater," and then I would be like, "Oh, the puppets! Now those are cool." That's just how I interacted with with I, the show. I, I I liked him a lot better than the puppets. Hmm, you were scared of the puppets a little bit, weren't you? A lot of kids I were. Did. I just didn't like puppets, man. Because you did all the voices and could, some of them I were just, freaky. I could feel the hand, there was a hand in there. It just felt <laughs> weird, that's wrong. That's wrong. Maybe there was a father figure thing happening, I don't know. Oh, Mr. Rogers was your uh, stand-in father. <laughs> yeah, let's say that. Okay. But the, I mean, his. I got a kick out of his son being interviewed for the, for the documentary. Great documentary, one of the best of last year. I recommend you watch it if you have any connection to Mr. Rogers. What's your number nine? Um. The Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Uh-huh. Uh, of course, you know that 
many memes have been created about this if you didn't happen to see it when it happened between 1990 and 1996. Um, but for me, this was, this is like the first, obviously I watched like Growing Pains and Family Ties and all those, those sitcoms coming up, mm -hmm. but this was the first one. I remember watching the first episode. Yeah. And just thinking, this is different, man. Well, it was for it was it was the first one I think to complete that thought that was made for us. Like somebody made a show amongst all these other shows that we like. Family Ties is for the family. Perfect Strangers is, you know, I would Perfect watch, Strangers almost made my list. I would I would almost watch I would watch Frasier. You know, these shows I was that a like fan of Frasier as again. Well. There's only so many shows, so many channels, and nothing's on demand. So you kind of had to watch a stuff that was for adults and just right. get in where you fit in. I do remember that since, I don't know how we knew that it was coming on. I don't know how the marketing got to us, but I remember watching that first, expecting the first episode, you know, having been such an obsessive fan of Yeah, their, their already music. fans of the music. And it's, whoa, this is the first show that's made for us. Like I'm trying, I'm explaining to my mom, this is, the, this is the guy from Parents Just Don't Understand. Right. Nightmare yeah. on my street. Because there was the whole like, uh, Cosby show then the a different world mm -hmm. and you kind of felt like a different world was a little bit more because it was college it was a little bit it was reaching a little bit more into yeah. our age group and I watched it and liked it but this was all of a sudden it was the the age that we were that you know in 1990 uh we were like thir I was like 13 mm -hmm. and so when it started I was just about to begin this whole high school experience and so it was the perfect time and I just thought everything about it was perfect. It was incredibly, and, and let me tell you right now. Yeah. It does hold up because my kids. It really does, yeah. My kids got into watching The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air uh, a couple years ago when it was. Mine too. On whatever platform it was on. It's You can still get it, but they ended up watching every single episode in, a, in like a, few months, like every time I got home, they would be watching another episode of The Fresh Prince and then telling me about what they were getting into. And I would sit down and, and watch some of it. And I was, it's obviously it's ridiculous in a lot of ways, but uh, yeah, for me, it changed the way I thought about half hour sitcom, like studio-based sitcoms. Yeah. And exactly what you said, it felt like it was for me. And uh, Will Smith, before he started his YouTube channel, I think it's on another YouTube channel, it might have been right when he started, nope, I take it back. When he started his YouTube channel, he told a story, and you if, you, if you're into the Fresh Prince, you gotta look this up. The story of the Fresh Prince being made. I kinda don't wanna spoil it, but um, I, my mind was blown by the fact that as big as a celebrity he was, like, I don't know if he won a Grammy, Grammy nominated, like, he was broke. And he tells this story of he's over at Quincy Jones' house at a party, mm -hmm. and like Quincy Jones um, has a, has the script, or is talking to a guy who has the script, I can't remember the story exactly, but basically he puts him on the spot to audition at the party and forces him to do it even though he didn't want, he said, I'm not ready, I can't do this right now. And it was like this make or break moment for Will Smith, even though from my perspective, he was like one of the biggest stars in the world because he was this amazing, amazingly hilarious rapper. Yeah. He was like the Mr. Rogers of rapping for me. Like I felt <laughs> like I had a relationship with him. And, um, but he was broke, he'd, he'd blown he all the money. Spent all his money, yeah. Spent all the money and he was desperate. And out of that desperation came them rewriting this script that was written for somebody else for him and it became the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. He tells the story great. Um, we'll have to, I'll have to tweet it out. Um, that is my number five. Oh wow! So okay. it's, it's higher on my list. Uh, man, it was just such a special time. That was back, when, and then is that next album was going to come out, which ended up being a flop. But we were like waiting for it, and we didn't know when. We didn't have information. There was no internet. So I remember waiting. Nobody's talking about this on the news. I remember going to the. The Especially if you, if you didn't have cable, but I didn't have cable at my house, so there's no MTV. Yeah. Every weekend, I'd go to get my mom to take me to a record bar, and I would just 
hope it would be there. And then I finally asked them and they, turns out the people there, they knew when albums were coming out. I said, oh, three more weeks is coming out. I, would, I couldn't wait. But to answer your question about how we found out about television shows, it was commercials. It was you were, you'd be watching a show and there would be a commercial and you would learn, oh, there's a new show that's got the Fresh Prince in it. And, the, and you would be like, when is that coming on? And they would tell you and you would watch it. That was the only way you found out about things. Yeah. Because it wasn't like there was billboards. And, and you could set your Creek. VCR to tape it, but I never did that. No. I just, I, you'd miss them or you'd get them on the rerun. Yeah, we never, never did that. My number nine is, I think you've alluded to it later in your list, the Dukes of Hazard. Mm, yes. When you, so. Number four for me. Wow, <laughs> number four for you. Yeah. Dukes of Hazard uh, ran from 1979 to 1985, and I don't know at what point Bo and Luke were replaced by their cousins. Pretty, I mean, in late. my mind, it's pretty late. I did not watch that. No, I tried. That was a huge betrayal of what I was interested in. Yeah, they weren't. The, I thought they were the same guys. I thought they did what they did with um, years later with uh, the Fresh Prince's aunt. Like the actress changed. Yeah. After like next season comes back, it's like uh, she's a different one. Aunt Biv. Aunt Biv. Um, but anyway. I mean, it was just Southern, you got this General Lee car, which you can't do that. No, no, Like no. I don't even, I don't even, I'm not even gonna say that's a good thing. But I will say that uh, half of the fan mail that was sent to the show was, a, was addressed to the General Lee. <laughs> <laughs> Fun fact. Seriously? Yes. It, I mean, that, that racist car was was a character on the show. I it? had the car. It wasn't like Kit from Knight Rider, which did not. It didn't make have a personnel. It, it it had a Confederate flag on the top of the car. Right. Uh, and I had that car just to give you the. This is just the way we grew up. I had that car in my, that model car in my house, uh, on my shelf, and I had a, a bunch of Dukes of Hazard like toys and I had a, I have a Dukes of Hazard cup that I think I still have in my house. We, di we didn't call it Dukes of Hazard, like you said the first time, you, Dukes of Hazard. Dukes of Hazard. Like I didn't even know what, that Hazard was a county really. Like I didn't, like I didn't, to me, Dukes of Hazard was just one word yeah, that didn't. meant every Thursday night, I go to my nanny's house and we're gonna watch the Dukes of Hazard and then when that's over, I have to sit there while they watch Dallas, mm. which came on right after. Not quite the same. That was not, I was not into that well, at all. The, there was kissing on that. The reason that it's so high in my list is because like the A-Team, it's one of the first shows that I could remember being appointment television for my family, but mm -hmm. the Dukes of Hazard was the thing that I thought about as early as I can remember television. And Cole and I, my brother and I would, uh, sometimes we would dress up like Bo and Luke because he, he had darker hair and I had, my hair was pretty blonde at the time. And we would dress up like them sometimes to watch the show. Um, and then- You were cosplaying. And then, so the show was on, you just said through 79 to 85. So yeah. when I moved to California, now you may, if you watch the show, you kind of see the the, car running around and you're like, that's not Georgia. <laughs> mm -mm. That doesn't look like Georgia, that looks like California. And of course I didn't know what California looked like. We moved to California in 1984 and my dad says, I'm gonna take you to where they filmed the Dukes of Hazard." And so he <laughs> took us out to, um, I don't remember where it was, but it's, it was the place that they would shoot all the car scenes of the generally flying over in the river and doing all the stunts and stuff. Yeah, it was like and it was demolition derby, and it was just that there would be a scene in every episode that would be like, oh yeah, the car, the car doing some well, epic the jump. Well, the car would do a jump, and then it would pause, and then Waylon Jennings would say, "Now these boys didn't know what was about to happen," yeah. and then it would it's go to so commercial, great. and then it would come back and unpause the car, and then the car would land. I mean, everything about that show, at the time in my life, in the way that I was taking in entertainment. It just, it it checked all the boxes. Man. It wasn't, I mean, except for the filming location, it was so distinctly Southern. Like, I felt like it was a documentary. Like, 
when I turned off the television and got back in the car, I was driving around in Hazard County. <laughs> like, well, I don't know how well you remember it because you remember it in like Boss Hog. Did you know anybody who wore an all white suit with a top hat? And Almost. <laughs> I'm telling you. In like, my world, it wasn't quite that I, <laughs> quite, I, quite that I, extreme. It was, it. you know, like with my relatives in my world. Okay, I get it. It was, I felt like it was just a reflection of reality. And it was, except for the, the way the cars behaved when they, you know, hit obstacles, they would somehow just be, you know, ejaculated into the air. Whoa, okay, that's a or word. Or projected that, that I, into the air is did, what maybe I should have said. Yeah, they probably didn't um, use that word on the Dukes of Hazard. I had a, I had a play set where you'd rev up the car and you'd let it go on the thing and it, and it would go through a barn and it had a ramp inside of the barn and when it came out the other side of the barn, it would like turn on its side and then do a do a barrel roll and land. And I had that set at my nanny's house mm. too. So uh, yeah, we'd watch that together. I mean, it was just, it was magical, man. Um, well, we should move on, we got a lot to go. What's uh, your number nine, eight? Well, Where, your number, number eight. eight. Uh, Animaniacs. Wow, we we really do have a lot of similar, I thought our list was gonna be totally different, honestly, I don't so, know why. So what number is Animaniacs for you? Animaniacs is number six for me. Okay. Um, so we're, we're we're around the same well, area. I'll let, so I think the guy, the guy who has it ranked higher should start talking about it. So that was from 1993 to 1998. I remember watching it after school. Yep. I, I don't know that I could have articulated it. I, 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 I guess I would have to. It was the humor. I mean, it was so specific. Absolutely, the specific jokes. I mean, like Pinky and the Brain. I'm gonna cons- they. It had its on spinoff show later, which I, I've never actually watched, but that was gold. Mm-hmm. And then the way that the Animaniacs would, they would say that. I think there was innuendo. There was all. It was all types of. I mean, it was very joke heavy, and it was very there was a lot of winking at the at the older audience. You felt, and I was just old enough, yeah, to know that you was happening. You felt like you were well. I'm sure there was other things, but you know, obviously, The Simpsons, which did not make my list, um, uh, was happening around the same time. But something about mm-hmm. the the darkness and the the weirdness that was the Animaniacs world view and the way that they saw things and the way that they pointed out things and the way that they talked about things. It was a little bit of that old school Warner Brothers, um, any you know, crazy physical thing, but then it brought this second layer of smart, dark humor. It was subversive. And it was hitting exactly the right time in ninety three to ninety eight. So I was watching it, mm-hmm. you know, from basically in high school, like you said. And I, and at that time, because by the time you're in high school, like schedules a little bit, bit crazy, it would come on after school, and so it was one of those things that I didn't always see, but I never didn't stop and watch it if it was on. And yeah, I did, again, I to me it it made it made the list because of how. It was revolutionary. I think most of the things in, in, in the list for me were revolutionary in their own right, yeah. and that's what made me, them revolutionary in my own life. I think it would be higher on my list if I would have moved on to watching other animated comedies, which now is this on genre. I mean, you talk about, you got the whole adult swim of it all, and you know, I mean, yeah, the, the, the Simpsons obviously didn't make my list because I, I, I'm i still embarrassed to say I've never watched a complete episode of The Simpsons. It was one of those things that um, I, I think I was, at a young age, I was told you're not supposed to we watch it. We weren't allowed to watch it. We weren't when allowed it, to when watch it, was it happening. when I was. Re- when it was a, early years. Early years, and then I, I just wasn't a subversive kid, so whenever I was told not to do something, then I just think I said, oh, I guess that means all the way into f- forever when the show is like the most amazing show in the history of television, not just animation. The longest running, or I don't know what the record is, but. It did, I, and I've seen The Simpsons, the reason it didn't make my list is because uh, I it it didn't influence me, it wasn't as impactful. I, and I appreciate the show, I think the show is funny, 
I think that Family Guy is significantly funnier, personally. Okay. Family Guy did also did not make my list either, though, because they just didn't, you know, they got crowded out by things that were more influential and more impactful. Um, I'm gonna go with your number my eight. number eight. Flight of the Concords, mm. season one aired in 2007. And I, I, I felt like I had to put it on the list because um, from a professional standpoint, it's still something that whenever we talk about scripted projects, we, we can't not mention it. Yeah, I mean, even whenever we talk about our music, and we've talked about this in the past about how I, you know, I even have this chip on my shoulder against those guys because I think they're so talented and that the show um, was so great. Um, but it's, it's, it still has ripple effects through how we do things because we have to run interference with how much do we want to be compared with anything we're developing uh, versus contrasted with it. Well, and thankfully, uh, they only did it for two seasons. Yeah, I, I mean over a decade I, I, ago. I'll, I'll say that. Like, I think one of the one of the best things that ever happened to us is the fact that Flight of the Concourse decided to do things on their own. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> I, 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 I just think, and then they are playing uh, again. I think it, did Brett's arm ever heal? I don't know what the latest of that was, but I think they are playing yeah. together again. Uh, but we've been huge fans for a long time. It didn't make my list, honestly, just because I kind of didn't think about it when I was from a professional standpoint. I felt like it had to. It had to make it had to make my list. Yeah, it, well, be, and not just. It's a, I mean, it's great. I mean, the tone of it. Well, the, the, the fact, that it, and I'll say specifically, the fact that it was on HBO, but it was such a specific quirky tone that it instead of going over an edge or saying, okay, the pilot episode's got to have nudity in it. I don't care what it is because it's on HBO. You know, it was they were playing by their own sets of rules. They found their edge in a different place. Right. They found their and, edge in the fact that they were weird. And that's very inspirational to us. Um, and obviously the the fact that they incorporated music, I mean, for for years when we talked about what our scripted idea would be, you know, our first scripted idea, which ended up being Buddy System, obviously we, we had to weigh it against the fact that we knew we were gonna do music videos, but like how do we do this without being compared to Flight of the Concords? Turns out the way you do it is just do it and have nobody see the show that you make. That's the greatest way to not be compared to the Flight of the Concords. That's a different chip on our shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not bring too many into this. What's your next one? Uh, number seven, The Office. Okay. Uh, my number seven is The Office. No. We have aligned. Oh, really? Yes. Wow, okay. The Office ran from 2005 to 2013. Yeah, and for me this was, what The Office represents for me is sort of my homecoming to half hour comedy, right? Yes, yep. So there was this period of time. College. College where your schedule is just, college is about movies. At least it was yep, for, for us. For, for us. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was our discovery of movies, being able to watch whatever you wanted to. There's nobody there to tell you you can't rent that, that you're not old enough to see that and you just watch all these movies. Talking about porn. Uh, no, I'm not talking about porn specifically. It's a different story. We could do another podcast on that. Uh, yeah. That was what the-, the That's what it sounded like you were talking that's about. That's what the, uh, the, the computer lab in the library was for. <laughs> but I, specifically, the uh, college was about movies, and so then, in, of course, it was, it was the South, and uh, we got married right out of school, and- Yeah, you got married in 2000, you got married in 2001. And it then- started th th in and then we're but... watching Survivor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Uh, and by that point, uh, Seinfeld was was off, uh, so you could like watch reruns or whatever. Right. But you're kind of sitting around waiting for something good. And I just remember all of a sudden. And again, I know the 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 British office is better. Oh gosh! Don't shut give up. Me that. Shut up about that. We know it came from England. We know they're funnier. We know they start everything and we just bite it. We've been through that. Um, but but it is different, we make it different. Yeah, we make it different and um, we make it for longer as well. And we, <laughs> we run it into the ground. Uh, so we both started with season one of The Office and I just watched it for a few years but then kind of fizzled out. I think it was the advent of children into my life. Well, no, 
Lily was born in 2003. She was born the year that it started. No, no, 2005. Right. Two years later, she was two years. Yeah, Locke was one when, when I started watching it. I don't know why. I've, I don't know why I fizzled out from watching it, but I will say that um, when we were hanging out with Britton, when he was on lockdown because he was on The Voice, he was just binge watching The Office. So he talked to my kids about it a lot, and then Lily started watching The Office, and Lincoln got into it, and now. Lando's gotten into it, and we all have started watching The Office. And I'm watching. I'm, I, I got in at the uh, in their stream, right? So now I'm watching the. We're watching the the final Steve Carell season together. Oh wow! And I've actually, you know, The Office was my favorite show, but again, I didn't get to this point for some life reason. I'm watching it for the first time, and let me tell you, it. I mean, at, at least that season. I don't know if it if it hit a lull before it or after he left. It hits a lull uh, after that. Um, they they, they, take, they take some time to find some footing. It is without Steve. Had you seen it? I because I will say, it's yeah. masterful writing. Like the, the way that these characters that you're attached to, the way that they use them, and it just everything about the way they construct episodes to give a growing sense of he's leaving, but also a sense of closure that's not um, the finale of the season. It happens yeah, kind of in the middle of the season. And then what they did afterward with the people, with the people that they bring in and the way that they made a transition I thought was as brilliant as you could you could hope for. Well, to to me, the reason that the office is was so revolutionary and so influential for for me personally, uh, again, it was it was innovative, right? It, that we, we take it for granted, but at least it was for me. It was the first thing that popularized this whole breaking the fourth wall as part of the show, right? And which is a credit, I guess, to the Ricky Gervais, right? And I'm yeah, Steve Merchant or whatever but, his name is. But I'm saying, but I'm saying, when it got to me, it right. was it was the American version, and um, it was just so, like, in, it was so specifically funny, and like it, it was on network, but it wasn't trying to be a show for your parents. It wasn't. A, it wasn't like we got to do this and we got to take this out and that's a little too weird. So let's not go there. Laugh tracks and none it, of that. It, yeah. Right. Again, first one, first real half hour that I cared about. That it was uh, a single did, camp. Was a single camp. So it was revolutionary. And of course, then you got Parks and Rec, which was it didn't make my list because I just feel like it was. Uh, it was just like The Office. I may actually like it more as a show ultimately, but The Office was so influential. And it, those shows have, it's, The Office especially, has had this incredible resurgence. Like, I was yeah. looking at like the Netflix stats. You know me and the Netflix stats, I'm always in there. Um, I didn't even know those were public. They recently published what is the most streamed, what is most streamed on the okay. platform. I don't remember, Office may have been number one. I can't remember, but um, it was very high up on the list of just the number of hours of uh, shows that have been streamed in The Office, Parks and Rec's really high, because all these, our kids are now, again, my kids watch The Office, and there's all these memes <laughs> related well, to The Office. And there's a there's this thing that struck me was like, everybody is stupid. Yeah. Like, I'd forgotten, and I felt like I was, I didn't have an appetite for the whole sitcom, like, this suspension of disbelief in order to like, no one ever talks like this, no one is this extreme, there's gotta be something to ground this thing, like, there's none of that. And it's, but it's so masterful that you get over it, but I actually thought, I actually thought that I couldn't get it into the office or The Good Place or any sitcom, network sitcoms anymore, even the best ones, and I think they're both amongst it, um, because I just thought I was more of a, I don't really watch comedies. Like I watch, like ever since Breaking Bad, I'm just like into gritty. If you're gonna, you can have humor in something, but like I just don't have an appetite for comedy anymore. And I thought I'd lost it and I've regained it. You've regained, oh, congratulations. Thanks to The Office. And by the way, I'm crying, especially at this pocket of this season. I'm crying just as much as I'm laughing. Oh yeah. It's, it's so, 
They're so good at it. Yeah. But it's such a it's such a suspend your disbelief world, right? I mean, yeah. the whole yeah. the whole sitcom thing, like the way that Yeah. Uh we're we're going to have to get moving fast here. Uh What is summer really special? Just keep going. Um number 6 for me, Alias. All right, we're overlapping again. Alias, I'm putting up at my number three. Whoa. And, but I, th- I think it's, it represents a new genre of watching. I think we'll say the same thing, so go for it. Well, yeah, well, no, you go, because it's near number three. This ran from 2004 to only 2005. Do I get that right? Probably not, but. Um, no, it, 2001 to 2006. Okay, I don't know why I wrote that. Well, oh, I, I know what Because you watched it in I, 2005. I, that's, that's right, I watched it. He, that's that's why it's on my list for this. It's on my reason. list higher because it was the first thing I ever watched, not streaming, but on mail order DVD. First television show that you you binged that I binged watched. That, and that's why it's on my. It list. was great. Every episode was it was kind of self contained but then not really because it would have a cliffhanger at the end. You'd have to watch the next one, and then lo and behold, because I'm a few seasons behind, and I have blockbuster video by mail not Netflix, I can watch, I can have two discs mailed to me, I can take one into Blockbuster, hand it in and get the next alias there while the other one's coming in the mail. I had a whole system. Yeah. Couldn't do that with Netflix at the time. Because I do think that it's important to, uh, you know, my wife is, because it was very significant part of our marriage of like, yeah. Now we sit down and we watch a television show every single night until we've gone through the entire season. Yep. Binging. That never never that done that was, before. That was a novel concept that just a few of our friends were starting to do. Like the first season we watched the physical DVDs that somebody had bought and then given to us. Yep. And then we transitioned into the blockbuster uh uh mail order thing. And it, I think that I don't think the show, she wants to go back and watch it. Like Jesse's like, we should watch it again with the kids. And I'm like, all right, we can try that. We did that with Lost, mm-hmm. which almost made my list, but didn't. Um, and I think Lost did hold up. I don't think the alias is gonna hold up. I don't think that it was masterful television. J.J. Abrams is making a new show with Sidney Bristow. Oh, Jennifer okay. Garner. I just think that it was. Just watch that one. It was, again, innovative, ahead of his time, and it changed we, how we watched. We television. hit it. It hit us at the exact right time. And of course, it's the only way that you watch television now. I mean, obviously, some people, right? Uh, if there's a show that's released on a weekly basis, we'll watch it. But I kind of tracked. I w- we went when we were out of that. We watched Friday Night Lights. We binged all of that. Oh gosh. We watched House, which is a great show. Uh, we watched West Wing. We watched Twenty Four, which Kiefer Sullivan hasn't even watched a complete episode of Twenty Four. Gotcha. Is that a f- fun fact? Fun fact. Prison Break and Lost. Like all of a sudden, you get into this binge thing where it's like, well, I don't need, I don't need appointment viewing anymore. So that's why it, I put it pretty high on my list because it just changed habits. Yeah. What's your next one? Uh, number five is Northern Exposure. Northern Exposure. Northern Exposure is my number four. Oh wow! I keep beating you. It's like at some point you must have things high on your list that I don't have at all. That might I don't know be the what case. What is happening at the end of your list? Northern Exposure ran from 1990 to 1995. It's funny that a lot of the things that we really like are in this um, this early 90s to mid 90s. It, I love a good world. I mean, Joel Fleischman, this Jewish doctor, is shipped off to Alaska to like work in this village. And he's like a fish out of water, and um, he wears a puffy vest. And he meets Maggie, who has a short p- hair. But and then there was the old guy who was who Maurice. Was not Maurice was the ex astronaut. Oh, but his Harlan or something like that. Yeah, his arch rival, who then they became friends, but because they were both doting over the same girl who was like eighteen, and then they got married. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. everything was weird. And Kelly. You just, you just felt really right. weird about watching it, but like, it was so good. And uh, and then there was the DJ. It, it was, now I'm sure that some of these tropes, they were pulling on previous television, but 
you had the really smooth talking, not, it wasn't smooth talking, he was just like, had this silky smooth voice and he was super nice, the DJ who would kind of like help you understand the world and the way that he t he talked and. It, it, you had this feeling of well, living there. It was not the first because the, the show that I'll talk about that's higher up on my list is the first show that made me cry at a television show. Okay. But I cried at this television show. And it was also, for me, one of the first shows that I watched alone. I watched it alone too. So I was making that transition into a place where, okay, my parents have a TV downstairs, in their bedroom by this point, you know, yeah. when I'm in high school. There's a television in the living room. And then there's a television in what we call the extra room, which was that little room upstairs. Um, and this is when I would go into the extra room and I would watch Northern Exposure and I would just kind of sit there and just be so immersed. Yeah. You know, there was just, there was nothing between me and the world. I was in there, my mind, my heart were completely committed to this character and, and, and this world. It was And quirky. then I would just find myself laughing and crying at the same time. It was, and it was, Comedy written into character quirks, not written into jokes. You know, it was a drama, it was a dramedy, but it wasn't It wasn't joke oriented. And I actually think that's something that it is a big influence on us in terms of like, you wanna build a funny world, you wanna build a quirky, you wanna build weirdness into characters and setting. Yeah. And, and that can carry a lot of the comedy. And so it's not about, a barrage of jokes. Um, it's, and about, actually, it's about relationships and, and moving, I, and I, yeah, moving a viewer. And I don't think that, you know, I don't think we've made anything like that yet. But that, I, I think that is our aspiration. It's influenced us and we wanna make something like that. But I think that, you know, the main expression of scripted that we've got in, in Buddy System is very, very joke heavy and is super surreal. Um, it's weird, but it's also like absurdist. And we love that and we wanna make that kind of thing and want to make more of it, but yeah, it, I think that what we connect with the most is that thing that is that mix of, it's, it's that dramedy. That's what we enjoy the most. It's also kind of intimidating to get that right. It's easier to do just crazy joke heavy comedy, you know, because you don't just move on to the next joke. If you're not connecting with this character, maybe you're laughing at him. Yeah. All right, give me your next one, because I only have two left. On, I got well, my number two. What's my your number, number five? My oh. number five is Fresh Prince. And you just, okay. And my you, number four is Northern Exposure. My number three is Alias. My number four is Dukes of Hazzard. We've already talked about that, which moves me to number three, which is SNL. SNL is your number three, okay. Yeah. SNL is my number two. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm, I think my list is just your list notched up a couple. Uh, okay. Now, of course, SNL is running since the 70s forever, it's still going. Yeah. Oh, it's still um, going? It's Yeah, it's still I going. Did, I didn't know. I watched the Matt Damon Christmas episode on my phone in bed. I was like, man, this is the first time I watched SNL in years. I like watched one clip and then I ended up watching everything. Yeah. Just laughing out loud. I was like, I'm really glad that this is really funny. Well, and it may, it may strike you, I don't know, depending how old you are. If you're our age, this is probably makes a lot of sense. If you're younger, uh, this may be what? This may be a little bit of a head scratcher, but I think that Lorne Michaels said it best when he said that everyone's favorite era of SNL is when they were in high school. And that is- Met Potentially middle school. Yeah, and that is- I think for us, it well, was- Well, started in middle school. It, start, it absolutely started in middle school. And um, that, I mean, yeah, that's my favorite season. I think there was, it's, it was actually in the midst of a big transition period, because I kind of looked into this a little bit. Because I, I remembered, I remember Chris Rock, and then his last season was, I remember Norm MacDonald hosting Weekend Update, and that was the first season that Chris Rock was gone. Norm was there the year before, but you know, um, and then Chris Farley coming in, Will Ferrell came in, but it was um, when, why am I, why am I losing? The name, the Canadian dude from Wayne's World. What's his name? Mike Myers. Yeah, Mike Myers. Uh, he was leaving, but it, it. A lot of people say it wasn't a strong 
point, but for us, it was all we had. Yeah. And if you could, you'd stay up as late as you could, and then we'd have to get up and go to church the next morning, and we would like skip out on Sunday school, stand in the hallway, and just talk about the sketches. Yeah. You remember that? Oh yeah. And just well, obsess over and then be, the impersonation. Well, and we and, talked about this in the, um, earlier, the, I don't remember how long the Deep Thoughts by Jack Candy ran. That's uh, right. But that was a big thing for us. Yeah. Uh, we actually just insert that it was inserted in something that we're working on right now that we'll That's talk right. about soon. But we put a reference in there, and uh, it's also in the in the book of mythicality. Yeah, you see that in the inserts to our church bulletin, we would write our versions of Deep Thoughts by Jack Handy. that weren't actually funny. It was our it was some of our first comedy writing, and then we met. Um, we met. Who did we meet that had a John connection? Fortenberry directed season one of Buddy System, and yes. he he. He worked on Deep Thoughts. He worked on Deep Thoughts. I was gonna say co-created, but I don't know if that's true. I think he, he did, worked with I Jack. I think he worked with Jack and maybe directed those spots. That's right, because Jack Handy was a real person, a writer on SNL. And Jack Handy, I looked him up when I was thinking about this, uh, continues to write. He had a number of Deep Thoughts books. The first one published in 91 or 92, which is why it's yeah referenced. And uh, he continued. He, like, he, he's like self-publishing. He ca he kept doing it, and he's still a, a humorist that does these absurd things. But anyway, also Adam Sandler's songs. I mean, you start to think about it. Really plants a seed. I believe in our minds that like we can write funny songs. Well, it was our. We can do it that. was really our only exposure to um, sketch comedy. Absolutely, you know, we didn't watch stand up. I well, I would watch stand up on. A uh, Showtime of the Apollo. I would, or I would watch like a Sinbad special. Yeah, and I just thought that Sinbad's comedy specials were the most incredible thing <laughs> I'd ever seen. But we didn't. But very unapproachable. We weren't really students of comedy in that we didn't have any anybody. We, we, stand up wasn't a thing. Like we weren't listening to like you know old tapes of George Carlin or whatever. A lot, right. of, a lot of people coming up in comedy were getting that, but we just come came from a different place, and so we had NBC. On Saturday night, and if you could stay up, yeah, there was like this reward of like, oh, you can if you if you can sneak and stay up late enough and stay awake. Well, and if you can stay up after SNL, you can watch Party in Progress. Oh goodness, that's right. Remember that? Oh yeah, it was just. It Is was that like, still a thing? No, Party was, in Progress. It was a half hour show. It, no, all it was was a bunch of girls in bikinis. At parties. At parties, and they would just film all of them. I think they just went to Daytona Beach in, for like two weeks. In my 16 year old break. mind, it was the best thing that anyone have could, could have caught on film. I mean, it, it was revolutionary, and I was just hoping that no one would walk in. It was just people filming bikini contests and, oh, at Daytona Beach and just turning it into a, a show, show for, over the course for, of the for year. Us. For people in colder regions. I thought regions. it was made just for me. <laughs> I thought it was only broadcast in my television. <laughs> uh, I think I've told the story before, but I gotta mention it again. That, like The Nielsen ratings people sent uh, worksheets to our house. For some reason, my mom agreed to, um, I forgot to participate this. in the Nielsen ratings thing where you would write down what shows you watched every night. You keep yeah. a log, and then you would mail in. And you a, were literally a Neil son, a hand, which, which yeah. is which made it very, very appropriate. Conflict of interest, perhaps. So we'd handwrite the stuff we'd watch. We'd watch Entertainment Tonight every night, and then we'd watch I don't know all the other stuff we watch. But then I remember my mom like set it up to mail it, and I snuck, opened it, and added party in progress <laughs> because in, I wanted in, to. In bold. I had to do Don't my. Don't drop that party in progress. I had to do my part to like keep party in progress in progress. <laughs> but I didn't want my mom to know. Uh, it, uh, yeah. Party in progress is my number one. I'll just go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> just go ahead and cut to the chase. Oh man. No, it did, it did not make I gotta progress. Google that just to see if it still exists. It's like. It's just bikini contest. Um, that is my number two. I, I feel like it permeated our comedic sensibility to the point that it earned the next top spot. I'm just saying. Uh, yeah, and th th this was not easy. This wasn't easy, but. Uh, I accept your apology. 
What I, is what is your next? My one? number two is the Wonder Years. Oh, not even on your list. Uh, no, never watched it, but I knew it would be on your list. Okay, so this ran from 1988 to 1993. Starred Fred Savage, and uh, the narrator was Daniel Stern, who pl- who who really? was yeah. Who, every single episode, your doppelganger from Home Alone. Yes, does all the the narration as the adult version of uh, Kevin. Kevin Arnold looking back on his life growing up in the uh, 60s and 70s. And it captured me. So all those things I said about Northern Exposure are twice as true. So this is, I mean, I'm talking, and again, I was the first, this was the first show that I watched by myself. Okay. And because my parents, I, my parents didn't care about this show. My brother was into other things, and so it just hit me at this time. And I'm watching it. So Kevin is playing like a 12 year old, right? And I'm starting to watch this thing in 1988 when I'm 11. Yeah. So he's he's got this relationship with Winnie. He's got. His, I, I did. I remember Winnie. He's got who's really she was really great at math. She's super smart. And then he's she got his bangs. He's got his best friend Paul. And he's got his older brother who was a bully to him. So many things about his life were exact parallels to what I was going through. Uh-huh. Had, had an older brother who would hold me down and dangle spit over my face, just like his <laughs> older brother. <laughs> Wayne was his name. And But uh, the, he, you had a friend that was me, I assume. And you were, you were just like Paul. You didn't have glasses at Paul the time. Was quir- Paul was like a nerd. nerd. I wasn't a nerd. Uh, well, you may have not thought you were, um, but. Uh, <laughs> what about a Winnie? You didn't have, who was your Winnie? Well, you always have a Winnie. You always have the girl. In your mind. You have the girl that you're, fi- for me, I always had a girl that I was fixated on. It just rotated and, but the, and was a failure there was no nine comedy times out of 10. In that it was just drama. It was like the feels. Wrong, there was comedy. It was funny. It was funny in exactly the same way that Northern Exposure was. Oh, really? Maybe not as quirky, it wasn't quirky. as Northern, Northern Exposure, but no, it was funny. What I have a feeling it holds up. I don't know. I haven't ever gone back and watched it. Would love to watch it with the kids because but you'd it was pretty already much cry every episode, right? Uh, well, so what I remember is, I remember being in in, in the extra room and again just like weeping, like I was so invested. And like crying to the point that like, I really hope that my mom doesn't need anything from me right now because <laughs> I am so invested in the wonders. And of Kind course, of the same feeling you felt about Party in Progress but for different reasons. Exactly, and um, I don't know, it was just, it was so well done and I felt like I was, interestingly I felt like I was getting this insight into, um, I wasn't exactly getting insight into my parents' perspective because they were, the generational gap. So I was the age of the people playing the kids, but it was from a time that was a little bit after like my parents were, were that age. Mm-hmm. I don't know how that would have worked out mathematically. That would have been perfect, but I don't know. I just felt like you got this, every character was so well developed do and you rem- so relatable. Do you remember a moment like, like what was the defining moment? Do you remember the finale? What? No, I, my brain doesn't work like that. I don't. I, I have a horrible memory huh. when it comes to the specifics. I just remember the vibe and the general feel. Uh, but I just remember the way that he, like, the way that he thought about the Winnie, the way that he thought about girls and his friendships. It was just so hmm. relatable because you, you know me, like, I at at that age, at age eleven or twelve, I was already completely obsessed with girls. Like it, it, that wasn't, I wasn't a late bloomer. Mm-hmm. And so it, I, I was, I already had the, it was fixated on on different girls and imagine what a relationship, oh, if she was just my girlfriend then everything would be great. And if she was my girlfriend, it would be the only thing that I cared about. And and I felt like he kind of embodied that in a way, just the way that he was dealing with, with, with everything. It was the most relatable thing and it was just incredibly well done. It's very dramatic. I, I just I just didn't have an appetite for that drama at that point. But you like Northern Exposure, but you like Northern Exposure later, because this happened yeah. earlier, because right. you would have been you know, 10 years old or so when it started. 
Well, it seems that we are each to our number one and I pretty much know at this point that we agree because we both left off, it's just painfully obvious at this point that we agree on our number one and isn't that fabulous? Yes, it is. So our number one is Green Acres. <laughs> I actually watched Green Acres. I didn't. I watched reruns of that. Seriously, our number one is Seinfeld. Seinfeld. Absolutely. Um, so Seinfeld ran from 1989 to 1998. So once it really hit its stride after a couple of seasons, um, it was in our high school sweet spot when it was in its sweet spot. And I remember, again, appointment viewing, I'd, I'd hunker down in my bed, I'd get my homework done or I'd say, well, it's gotta wait. And if, it, I, would, I would tell mom, I'm watching Seinfeld in my room, hold my calls. <laughs> like if I remember Michael Juby calling me to do some homework and I it was like it was like I answered the phone 10 minutes before it came on and uh, I like talked to him for 9 minutes and then I was like hey dude I know this conversation is not anywhere near over but I got to go cuz Seinfeld's coming on. <laughs> like I was not going to miss it. Yeah. It was so the, the comedic voice was so specific and so unique to anything I had been exposed to. I mean, we were, I think we were primed for that Larry David cynicism because though we didn't watch Letterman, I mean, your dad had that dry wit. We, we resonated with that. I watched that, a, that a, sense a of little humor. Letterman at, did, the, at the same time. I, I just think that we were that, that type of observational dry sense of humor was something that we, that really resonated with us. And well, we it was the kind of thing where when they were riffing on something, you weren't just laughing at it, you were reveling in it. You know what I'm saying? So like, you were so blown away by the choices that were being made and the yeah. way that the jokes were coming, to, the way that the jokes would just happen and then the way that the whole story would come together at the end and these ridiculous plot lines would come together in this completely stupid way. Yeah, like there was, it, it, it was, was a, they would weave, a, they would weave three stories. Well, it's like, it was like. And it would all pay off touching, in, in one moment. It was like grabbing something that has the exact same vibrational energy. Like you grab onto something that is vibrating at the frequency that your body is vibrating at and it creates this, and I know that sounds crazy and, and listen. But it felt, you could feel it. Yeah, it, it, it is, it transcended. And now, let me just address something. Now, Ethan of H3H3 did an incredible job of addressing this when he um, reacted to the React video. Teens react. Where the teens were reacting to Seinfeld and basically just watch that. Uh, I, I just put H3H3 Seinfeld. Yeah, because their basic premise. And basically, was, I don't remember every th single thing that Ethan said, but his perspective is my perspective. And that is the fact that, I mean, I, part of it was the fact that was something that was being done on the show modern kids felt like, they, it made them feel uncomfortable, but they, they didn't get the joke. It seemed culturally insensitive, but they, and, and I'm sure it was at certain points, but, and lots of times that was the joke. Right. They were making, there was commentary. But a lot of people are like, I don't understand why it's funny, you know, these characters seem ridiculous, everybody's super selfish, and it's like, exactly! <laughs> yeah, and I, I didn't, you know? I didn't, re I couldn't have articulated that, that like, okay, this is a, I mean, they talked about how it's a show about nothing because they made a show within the show. They conceptualized the show within the show. Right. <laughs> and then tried to sell it, you know? Um, which again, that's just great. It's just so creative and self-referential. Well, but I couldn't have said, well, Jerry doesn't change. Like, we're gonna break the rule. Like, that was a ground rule that I couldn't have articulated. It's like, well, for successful writing, you, the characters no, have nobody, to have an arc. Nobody changed. It's like nobody changes. Nobody no, grows. Nobody's, they're all bad. They're bad people. Yeah, right, and they don't grow. <laughs> they're all completely <laughs> self-focused. But it free, I mean, it, and there are, there are characters, I mean, you look at House, like a very comedically self-centered, flawed character, 
but I dropped off, maybe he changes. It was like they stuck to their guns to the end. Yeah, well, I, I think they like got kind of schmaltzy with this Green Day montage, but other than that. But I think that the reason, again, this is completely subjective, right? This is very subjective. We're not talking about what the greatest television shows are of all time. This is the most influential, and I think that uh, even what you ever you think is the greatest is is so subjective. It's that thing that I'm talking about. Some intersection of our background and our sensibilities that were some weird combination of nature and nurture primed us to be completely ready to accept this. I think part of it had to do, and I think that you articulated the way that we think about it now with the fact that all these characters are selfish and they don't change. We wouldn't have been able to talk say that at the time, but one of the reasons I think that appealed to us is that we were in this the culture that we were growing up in, it was like, we were good boys. Mm -hmm. And we were being told how to be good boys and the things that you should believe and the things that you should, the way you should behave. And I think that all of a sudden, these people from New York who were all single, didn't have kids, didn't aspire to get married or have kids, and were not playing by any of the rules that all the adults in our lives were playing by. Mm -hmm. It was this opposites attract thing, and like I said, it was. A, but we had this yearning for some some kind of release, and instead of going out and doing ir irresponsible things, we watched like Seinfeld. Houses or we did some irresponsible things, but we we watched Seinfeld. We watched. I mean, I think SNL ser served the same purpose in a lot of ways. It was like it's a way to kind of revel in this thing where you kind of need a break from the setting that. Uh, you, you live in. And I'm not saying that kids growing up in New York didn't like Seinfeld, but for us, everything just lined up. And uh, it's the way that we. Th Who's your favorite character? Ooh, that's a, that's a really good question. I, I mean, I think it's, it might be, um, it might be either Jerry or uh, George's dad. <laughs> George's dad, who is Ben Stiller's dad yeah, right. in real life. Yeah. Um, Kramer's my favorite character. I mean, I love Kramer, of a course. Every time he entered, every, everyone would cheer. Yeah, I mean, well, he was great. Because he would enter, it was like a throwback. It and was he, like a, he was like a throwback to an earlier well, time and he of was comedy. He also the only character who actually wasn't 100% selfish. He actually was a good friend. He yeah. was selfish at the same time, but he was a good friend. Yeah, um, he was also an ass man. Yeah, well, <laughs> and so the uh, that license plate, John Voight's car, right? Was yeah, that the same episode. So, and, and so this is something if guys our age, people our age, who work in comedy, uh, have have these. You have this just the way that Larry David thought, kind of constantly running through your your mind, and you're trying to make sure that you're not just writing a scene or. A, a joke that is well that's just that's just Seinfeld or that's what is now curb your enthusiasm mm -hmm. which is a, a sort of a remix it's so influential that you just have to make sure that you're not going there all the time and another reason you don't want to go there all the time is because you know 20 year old people don't care about it don't think it's funny it's like they don't find it funny anymore cuz things, to, things change you're not wrong it's figure just out you're different if my kids would be into it like hey you like Parks and Rec, you like The Office. I started researching, does it hold up? They would not, and my of course, theory is. People who love it say it does hold up, but I have, I'm gonna test it on my kids. I was talking to them about it last night. Um, you know, Britain's a big influence. I'm gonna use Maybe him. it will hold up. He because said he loved it, so I bet you I can get my kids to love it. Here's the one thing that doesn't hold up. There's a lot of phone humor, and it's all written before the advent of cell phones and Google. Like specifically, not I'm not even saying the internet, but like a lot of phone humor, me, a lot of give me an example. Uh, answering machine humor. Uh, that's just what I read. I don't remember an example, but and then I was reading an article that said if you're going to introduce it to somebody, you should watch it in reverse. Like start with season 19 or whatever it was, watch that forwards, but then watch 18, 17, 16. I don't know how many seasons. There's there not that many seasons because it was a yeah, scripted I show. I think there's just as many seasons that there are years, right? Typically, that's how that's done. Anyway, that brings us to our number one. I do want to. I, I don't think it's on a streaming service. Interestingly you enough, you can't watch Seinfeld anymore. I don't think you can. I don't. I think you gotta. You gotta own it. 
Nine seasons, yeah. You have to get the nine seasons on DVD. It's at least what I've been told. We'll have to look into that. But all right, so we've we've completed our list and you hung with us. This is a longer ear biscuit, but um, well, th- thanks for hanging with us. And let us know uh, what you think about this format. It's something that we might do again. Uh, yeah, okay, you can watch all Seinfeld on Hulu. Jacob, just let us know. Um, Thank you, Jacob. Let us know if you want, you know, uh, what you thought about sort of this ranking, reminiscing uh, kind of thing, because obviously we can do this with things other than television shows. Uh, I enjoy talking about it. Yeah, uh, so use hashtag Ear Biscuits, let us know what you thought, and we'll speak at you again next week. Mm-hmm. Can I rattle off my honorable mention since we we're, we have time to fill? Sure. Reading Rainbow, Inspector Gadget, The Jetsons, A-Team, Small Wonder, watch mm-hmm. that after school. Mm-hmm. Uh, Small Wonder, the, the robot, in 2007, she was a nurse in Boulder Community Hospital in Boulder, Colorado. I tried to find her what she's up to now. Vicky, had a crush on Vicky. Hmm. Punky Brewster, also had a crush on her. Mm-hmm. The Ellen DeGeneres Show, I, that almost made my list. Because it's like, it was the first lesbian that came into my home every single day. Right. Of course, now I got all types of lesbians coming into my home. That's right. I yeah. love it. Yep. But, I mean, she was the first one. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't watch it. Uh, well, n- even now. It's, I mean, not the sitcom, the show that's still on now. Oh, yeah. I thought you were talking about the, sh- the, the uh, sitcom. It's been on a long time, though. Uh, Letterman. The Cosby Show, The Wire, Breaking Bad, and Mad Men, some of my favorite television shows. That's when you get into the best television right. shows of all time, I'd definitely be breaking those out. And The Price is Right. The only thing on my honorable mention uh, that you didn't cover on your list or there uh, was Simon and Simon. <laughs> Good theme song. And we also talked about uh, Perfect Strangers. Oh you yeah. You mentioned it, that was, that almost made my list as well. But which, in- in- interestingly, both our shows are about Two guys, um, Simon and Simon, private investigators. Yeah, you know the rough and tumble like ex ex vet, and then like the pretty boy, and then uh, Larry and Balky of the Perfect Strangers. To watch more Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist on the right. To watch the previous episode of Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist to the left. And don't forget to click on the circular icon to subscribe. If you prefer to listen to this podcast, it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for being your mythical best.